Hello and welcome to Abtop. Facing a challenge alone can make the journey to resolution feel overwhelming. However, when two people face a similar struggle, the burden eases, and solutions come more naturally. Discovering my wife's infidelity was a shock, but finding solace in my friend's similar experience ignited a shared resolve. Together, we decided to confront our unfaithful partners. The midweek ring of the doorbell marked the moment of truth in my wife's betrayal. As I opened the door, two individuals in ordinary clothes stood before me, their weary appearance revealing their purpose. It became clear they were not just visitors but likely collaborators in our carefully planned strategy with Frank, seeking justice. Good evening, sir, the woman greeted. Are you Mr. Douglas Franklin? Yes, I'm Doug Franklin. May I inquire as to who you are and the purpose of this unexpected visit to my home at this hour? I feigned ignorance, though I had a strong suspicion of what was to follow. Who's there, darling? King Joyce's voice, my wife, the dishonest, deceptive, well, never mind. She had been visibly jittery all evening, but more on that later. She was drying her hands on a kitchen towel as she entered the living room connected to the front entrance. I'm not sure yet, darling, I replied, striving to keep the sarcasm at bay in my tone as she approached me. A furrow creased her brow. Are you Mrs. Joyce Franklin? inquired the woman at the door, shifting her focus from me to my wife. The man accompanying her still hadn't uttered a word and appeared, if anything, bored with the entire situation. Listen, I interjected, attempting to feign irritation while secretly relishing what I suspected this encounter entailed, you've been asking questions here on my doorstep without even telling me who you are and what this is all about. With a resigned exhale, the woman withdrew her hand from her shoulder back, and the man behind her retrieved his hand from the inner pocket of his blazer. When they both simultaneously flipped their hands in what seemed like a rehearsed and synchronized motion, two police badges caught the glint of the front porch light fixture. I overheard Joyce, my spouse, let out a sigh as the woman announced, I am Detective Surgeon O'Neill, and this is Detective Scurry. We're investigating an assault that took place earlier today. We'd like to ask you and Mrs. Franklin some questions. I had rehearsed my faint expression of surprise a few times in front of the mirror in the past days, and now was the moment to test if it passed without raising any suspicions. What assault, and why would you assume that my wife or I have any knowledge about such an incident? I retorted with a hint of escalating irritation, also rehearsed in my tone and demeanor. Glancing at Joyce, I noticed her complexion draining and her expression morphing into one of sheer terror. She avoided making eye contact with any of us and seemed on the verge of hyperventilating. At this juncture, the male investigator interjected, detailing the assault that occurred earlier in the afternoon, resulting in significant trauma to the victim prior to undergoing surgery. During one of his rare moments of clarity, he identified Joyce Franklin as the main witness to the incident. This assertion was further supported by multiple other witnesses present at the scene. Feigning ignorance and surprise, I inquired, who exactly was the victim? I mean, my wife, the main witness, what, I paused momentarily, simulating the reaction of a genuinely surprised husband, as I continued to portray myself as an oblivious fool contributing to the unfolding drama that was now unraveling my wife's clandestine world. Mrs. Franklin, can you clarify the nature of your association with Mr. William Gerardo and what activities were you engaged in together at the time of his assault in the rear parking lot of the Newton Motel on King Street earlier today, inquired Detective Sergeant O'Neill. Well, that was straightforward. She was clearly aiming for shock and awe. There it was, laid bare. There was no escaping it now. Joyce let out a distressed cry, and it seemed as though she might faint. I turned my head gradually towards my wife, regarding her with a mix of curiosity and surprise, or so I hoped, which gradually shifted to alarm and then anger as she began to sob openly and retreat slowly from me. Friday. Frank. On Friday afternoons, the pace of work tends to ease up a bit compared to the rest of the week. So when my secretary Jan informed me of a call on line one. I wasn't particularly occupied, Frank. Simmons, I answered. Mr. Simmons, this is Deputy Gibson from the Cherokee County Sheriff's Office. Could I arrange to speak with you for a few moments this afternoon or evening, came the deep voice on the other end. Deputy Gibson, I'm curious. Could you elaborate on the purpose of your request? I inquired, realizing that Doug must have already followed through on his end of the deal for me to receive such a call. I'd prefer to discuss it in person, Mr. Simmons. Would it be possible for me to visit your residence later today or this evening? It's important that Mrs. Simmons is present for this conversation as well. 
In fact, her presence is necessary, he replied somewhat evasively. I felt relieved that he couldn't see the satisfied grin on my face when I responded, well, I must admit I'm puzzled but intrigued. Yes, you're welcome to come over. Does seven o'clock work? My wife, Sybil, usually finishes work by then, and we'll both be home when you arrive. 7 p.m. it is, Mr. Simmons. I'll see you then, with that, the call ended. I hung up, turned my chair around, stood up, and took a deep breath, feeling a sense of fulfillment as I looked out of my office window. Tonight, everything will be revealed. Then it struck me that I needed to follow through with my plan completely. I had to call home to warn Sybil about the impending visit from a sheriff's deputy, or else she might suspect, quite rightly, that I was setting her up. The house phone rang four times before going to voicemail, which struck me as odd since Sybil was expected to be home by this time in the afternoon. Perhaps she was simply occupied in the bathroom. I tried calling again five minutes later with the same outcome. After waiting an additional ten minutes, I left a message informing her that I would be home around 6.15 and mentioned Deputy Gibson's call, emphasizing my lack of knowledge about the impending visit. As I ended the call, I couldn't help but grin to myself, reflecting on how convincingly I must have sounded like a clueless husband, delivering the message with just the right hint of concern in my voice. Back to Wednesday, Doug and I had unleashed my pent-up anger by ranting and yelling at my frightened and tearful wife. To ensure I didn't escalate to physical violence, I made sure to express my emotions fully while Detectives O'Neill and Scully were present, both as protectors of Joyce and witnesses to my self-restraint. Once I had finished venting and had visibly calmed down, and after providing the detectives with all the information I could, I left the front room and headed upstairs. Having already decided what I needed to pack, hastily gathering clothes and toiletries was straightforward. Then I made a dramatic exit, stomping down the stairs with my suitcase and backpack containing my laptop and necessary documents for a few days. Meanwhile, Joyce remained sobbing on the sofa in the front room. The narrative unfolded with the assistance of the two detectives, revealing that my wife had visited the Newton Motel twice in her life. On both occasions, her purpose was to engage in sexual activity with a man named Bill Gerardo. However, the conclusion of her second visit turned out to be far more eventful than she had ever anticipated. Following Gerardo and her departure from the motel room earlier today, as they parted ways to head to their respective cars, a hooded figure emerged from behind a van parked adjacent to Gerardo's Lexus. This took Gerardo by surprise as he was facing his car. The unidentified individual wielded a baseball bat in one hand and seemingly paid no heed to Joyce's presence as she observed the scene for several minutes. The hooded figure mercilessly attacked Gerardo, inflicting severe injuries on him. Ribs, arms, legs, as well as what was between his legs, were damaged. Curiously, the robber did not try to rob him. Instead, he looked at Joyce, holding the bat on his shoulder, and then shook his head. Joyce, seized with horror, froze in place and was speechless. After the attacker disappeared into a nearby convenience store, passersby began to notice Gerardo's injuries. Some rushed to help, while others stood aside filming the scene on their cell phones. Gradually, people also noticed Joyce, realizing that she was with Gerardo. Several phones captured her image. According to eyewitnesses, she had finally managed to break free from the grip of her fear and had turned in panic to reach her Corolla. It took a considerable amount of frantic effort to insert the key into the lock before she could unlock and open the door and then hurriedly scramble inside to start the car. Once the engine finally roared to life, she sped away from the parking lot, with a few onlookers capturing images of her car, including her license plate. Detectives O'Neill and Scully reported that Mr. Gerardo had slipped in and out of consciousness during his ambulance ride to the hospital, uttering the names Joyce and Amy interchangeably. He was only awake briefly in the emergency room of the regional hospital, where he managed to answer a couple of police questions and mention Joyce Franklin's name before being rushed into surgery. So, Mrs. Franklin, once again I must inquire, what was the purpose of your encounter with Mr. Gerardo? Detective O'Neill asked, his expression devoid of emotion as he looked at my wife. She faltered, casting me the saddest look I had ever seen from her. Then, in a whisper, she said, Doug, I'm so sorry. Her gaze shifted away, tears streaming down her face. It was only when I started screaming for an explanation of what had happened that she finally admitted that she had met Gerardo at the hotel and had been in contact after that, but I was too enraged to hear her attempt to explain. But it's not what you think, yeah, I thought bitterly, straight from the infidelity playbook under the section of excuses for getting caught cheating. 
That's when I decided to put on a show, storming upstairs to pack my bags and leave. As I left the house we'd lived in for the past four years, a year of cohabitation followed by three seemingly blissful years of marriage, I couldn't help but reminisce. It had been merely half an hour since the two detectives had shown up, prompting my departure to the hotel room I had already arranged for a week's stay. Regardless of the outcome of this situation, I knew I needed to distance myself from the house immediately to maintain the facade. Mentally preparing myself to fulfill my part of the deal with Frank was crucial. I had to psych myself up for what lay ahead. It was time to put on my game face. Forward to Friday again, Frank. Upon arriving home Friday afternoon following Deputy Gibson's call, I came across several hardly surprising occurrences. Initially, I noticed Sybil, my wife of eight years, was absent along with her car. After setting down my gym bag and grabbing a yangling from the fridge, I glanced at the wall phone in the kitchen, noticing the blinking light indicating a voicemail message I had missed. Walking through the den, I sensed something was amiss, but my anger prevented me from dwelling on it. Upon reaching our bedroom, I sat on the bed to remove my shoes, shedding my shirt. I haphazardly aimed it towards the hamper, missing it entirely. As I removed my pants and moved to hang them in the closet, I observed that Sybil's clothes were gone. I let out a sigh and headed back to the bedroom. Upon opening her dresser, I noticed that all her underwear and personal belongings were gone as well. As I returned downstairs dressed in slacks, a polo shirt, moccasins, and no socks, I finally grasped why the den seemed different, several of Sybil's knickknacks, pictures, and other items were missing. Oh well, good riddance, I suppose, one might expect me to feel sad. After all, we had spent a quarter of our lives together. However, I was still too angry at the moment. Besides, I had to maintain composure when Deputy Gibson arrived shortly. Mr. Simmons, inquired Deputy Gibson, at what point did you become aware of your wife's involvement with Mr. Philip Avery? My wife involved with Avery? I feign confusion and surprise expertly. Are you suggesting my wife is having an affair with whom? I took a noticeable deep breath, briefly closed my eyes, and attempted to project an image of composure, though inwardly, I was struggling to contain my laughter. Eventually, until you spoke just now, Deputy, I was completely unaware that my wife was having an affair, I then opened my eyes, having just rubbed them with the forefinger and thumb of my right hand, which I had previously coated in Tabasco sauce moments before the deputy rang my doorbell. My eyes were visibly red, and tears were welling up as I addressed him, so, her paramour is this man what was his name again, Avery? He nodded slightly. I whispered heavily as I sat down, no, I had no clue. May I speak to Mrs. Simmons? Sir Gibson inquired, perhaps she can provide some insight into our investigation. Is she present? We'll require her statement as well. I shook my head, feigning bewilderment. She was gone when I arrived home, she had vanished, taking all her belongings with her. I mean I suppose she's left me. That's the only conclusion I can draw from this. It was time to shift my emotional gears to play the role of the aggrieved husband convincingly for the deputy's benefit. It was time to channel righteous anger. Exactly when did the sheriff's office start probing into the affairs of promiscuous wives who betrayed their devoted and unsuspecting husbands while those husbands toil away to support them? I rose from my seat, passing and gesturing dramatically, pausing. I shot the deputy a fierce glare. He seemed unperturbed, a veteran of such encounters, showing no signs of being impressed. In fact, he appeared somewhat bored. Mr. Simmons, we don't investigate cases of adultery or dalliances, as you put it. However, we do look into matters when such dalliances potentially lead to serious crimes like aggravated assault and battery, and possibly attempted murder, he stated calmly, his voice unwavering, yet his gaze remained fixed on me, assessing my reaction closely. Once more, I adopted an expression of surprise, echoing Captain Renault's famous line from the movie Casablanca silently in my mind. I muttered, I'm shocked, shocked to find that gambling is going on in here, deputy. I'm utterly astonished, utterly astonished to discover that my wife has been unfaithful. But do you honestly believe she would harm her lover, attempt to murder him? I queried, fully aware of the absurdity of my question. Deputy Gibson almost grinned as he drawled, No, I don't suspect she's done anything of the sort. What I'm investigating is who else might have had a motive to commit such an act, perhaps he added, fixing me with a piercing gaze, the betrayed husband, perhaps. Deputy. I assure you I was completely unaware of this liaison, and I am definitely not a violent person. May I inquire as to when this alleged assault supposedly occurred? 
Deputy Gibson hesitated for approximately 10 seconds, clearly assessing my reaction and considering how much information to disclose while also evaluating my potential involvement in the matter. The incident occurred in a motel parking lot on Lone Tree Road around 8.30 last evening. It appears that the motel has a bar connected to it, and the victim, Mr. Philip Avery, was a regular patron, often meeting with Mr. Simmons. Unfortunately, Deputy Gibson conveyed this without any visible sadness. He then proceeded, Yesterday evening, Mr. Avery had only consumed two drinks in the company of your wife, I might add. They both appeared unsettled, according to the bartender. After finishing their drinks, Mr. Avery went to his car in the parking lot. Shortly after, your wife left alone. An eyewitness in the parking lot reported seeing a man wearing a black ski mask wielding what appeared to be a baseball bat, assaulting Mr. Avery by striking him in the upper back. Subsequently, while the victim was on the ground, the assailant, still masked, proceeded to beat Mr. Avery across his body, avoiding his head but showing a particular focus on striking his groin area. Here, Deputy Gibson paused, seemingly expecting some reaction from me, whether shock, indignation, or culpability. In our experience, Mr. Simmons, Gibson resumed, this type of attack, especially the specific targeting of certain body parts, suggests a vengeful act, typically associated with a cuckolded husband seeking retribution against his wife's lover. I found myself unable to control my reaction, the mention of the word cuckold caused me to flinch involuntarily. However, aside from that, I managed to maintain a facade of innocence and disbelief regarding my situation. Deputy, I began after a moment, I'm still trying to come to terms with everything, so please forgive me if I seem a bit tense right now. With my wife leaving and learning this I trailed off, unable to finish my sentence. The deputy nodded, feigning sympathy, but there was a hint of expectation in their expression, as if silently urging me to continue and perhaps admit to something. I can assure you that I had no involvement in the incident you described last night, I said with a sigh. Aside from the connection you mentioned regarding my wife's knowledge of and relationship with this individual, Avery, last night I was in my office with my office manager, Janet Barkley, finalizing our business tax filings until nearly 10 p.m. You can contact her to confirm my whereabouts during the time frame you mentioned. Deputy Gibson simply nodded and remarked, Yes, I spoke to her right after you left your office this afternoon and before coming here. She has already provided your alibi. I had to feign anger to conceal any further information. What do you mean you already talked to her? Then why all the questioning and insinuations that I might be involved? Hey, calm down, Mr. Simmons, Gibson said, stepping back and positioning himself to react if necessary. We have to investigate all angles in these cases, and you must understand, based on past cases like this, the husband is often the prime suspect until proven otherwise. So, something else has come to light now that you know where I was during the assault. I asked, still displaying anger but maintaining composure, he suggested we explore other investigative paths and leave it at that for now, he remarked, ah, still attempting to unsettle me. Well, I had to feign indignation. Now, if you have any further suspicions and wish to inquire, you can do so through my attorney. Calm down, Mr. Simmons, Gibson interjected, palms raised as if to pacify any hurt feelings, his voice remaining steady. I doubt it will come to that. By the way, if Mrs. Simmons reaches out to you, please advise her to contact the Cherokee County Sheriff's Office and inform me as well of any communication with her. With that, he handed me his business card. Regardless, that's all I needed to discuss tonight. I truly regret the situation between you and your wife and how you had to learn about it. I'll take my leave now. Having said that, he put on his Stetson hat and headed for the door. When I was about to close it, he turned to me and reminded me, remember, if you hear anything from Mrs. Simmons, we'd really like to talk to her. I just nodded when he left, closing the door behind him. I exhaled slowly. Back in the dining room, this time I reached for the wild turkey instead of getting a beer in the kitchen. After taking my first sip, I silently drank to my friend and smiled. He went through everything for me, just as I did for him. Thinking about my now ex-wife, I muttered, sayonara baby. The next Wednesday, Frank, the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, seemed incongruous with the atmosphere one might expect in a divorce lawyer's office. Nevertheless, being a guy, I couldn't resist flipping through it while waiting for my appointment. I had checked in with the receptionist at Chantal Hawk's domestic law office, a renowned divorce attorney known for her fierce advocacy for her client's well-being. 
rumor had it that she had a particular disdain for unfaithful wives, a reputation that had spread widely among the discontented married men in Woodstock and throughout Cherokee County. Other lawyers, some judges, and even a few law enforcement officials trembled in her presence or at the mere mention of her name. It was now Wednesday of the week following the tumultuous events surrounding my wife's disappearance. For my life, after scheduling an appointment, which was confirmed for today, I received an email from Miss Hawk outlining crucial steps to safeguard my assets and well-being following the clearance of my initial deposit to her account via my credit card. If you've encountered any of the cheat stories online, you're likely familiar with the necessary but emotionally taxing tasks involved in preparing for a divorce, closing joint accounts, canceling credit cards, dividing savings and checking accounts, and updating beneficiaries for insurance and retirement accounts. Amidst all this, I reached out to Doug, informing him about my appointment, particularly regarding the timing. I purposely arrived approximately 30 minutes early for the appointment, intending to engage in our own subtle charade. As I flipped through the magazine, glancing at the models in swimsuits, I noticed another individual entering the office and approaching the receptionist. Pardon me, but I believe I may require the services of a proficient divorce attorney, a familiar male voice stated, one I recognized yet I feigned ignorance, refraining from turning to look. Certainly, sir, replied the receptionist, and how did you come to learn about Ms. Hawk? The questions continued, part of the receptionist's efforts to assess the efficacy of Chantal Hawk's marketing strategy while gathering preliminary information from the potential client. After approximately three or four minutes of waiting, the receptionist informed the man, if you could kindly complete these forms, we'll endeavor to schedule an appointment with Ms. Hawk. Unfortunately, she's fully booked for today and tomorrow, but we'll explore the possibility of fitting you in on Friday. The man's voice conveyed evident sadness and uncertainty as he responded, Oh, all right. There was a brief pause before he added, Um, may I inquire about the location of the restroom? Certainly, she replied, directing him, It's located in the main hallway of this office complex. Just exit through the door and turn left. That was my signal to intervene. I allowed the man roughly 20 seconds head start before setting aside my magazine and rising from my seat, flashing a smile at the receptionist I informed her. I need to use the restroom before heading in. Could you please let Miss Hawk know I'm still here? Of course, she replied, returning my smile. As I made my way out to the main hallway, in the men's restroom, I spotted him just wrapping up at the urinal. Quickly scanning the small space, I confirmed we were the only two present before he finished washing his hands at the sink. Turning towards him as he dried off, I inquired, Everything all right? A dubitable turned to me, offering a strained smile. Yeah, he responded, It's just that I never realized the extent of my anger until now, last week's incident. I've never hurt someone like that before. He had been avoiding direct eye contact, but now met my gaze directly, admitting, It's kind of scary, you know? I nodded and said, Yes, I understand. Listen, I wanted to make sure he was following along. We now have a valid reason for our acquaintance meeting at a divorce lawyer's office. Can you maintain this facade when we return inside? Doug nodded and replied, Yeah, I can. He then let out a sigh, indicating his effort to remain calm. I flashed a reassuring smile at him. Doug, remember, your situation is unique, and we both recognize that. Just keep in mind, when you reach the third page of those forms, you know, like I explained to you, where they inquire about counseling and the chance of reconciliation, then you, six months later, divorce. Doug shook his head. I'd not typically frequent bars, but this particular evening marked the six-month anniversary since Frank and I embarked on our joint endeavor, a venture born out of our shared frustration and desire to reclaim our agency. When Frank first approached me at my workplace and introduced himself, I was content and oblivious, enjoying a comfortable life with a fulfilling job and a loving spouse. I believed everything was perfect. Frank suggested meeting me after work, claiming he had important information to share. Though I was skeptical of his vagueness, he enticed me with promises of free drinks and dinner in exchange for hearing him out. Curiosity and the prospect of potential business opportunities won me over, so I agreed. That night, the cheerful world I knew turned dim, and my happiness faded once he concluded his narrative. He administered prohibited substances to her. Doug, you must bear that in mind and prioritize it. She didn't intend to betray you, Frank emphasized. He had shared with me photographs and transcripts from a private investigator's report detailing the investigation into Frank's unfaithful wife, Sybil. Until that moment, I hadn't realized that my wife, 
Joyce, was collaborating with Sybil, let alone developing a closer relationship with her. Joyce had started going to lunch with Sybil, who was slightly older. It seemed that recently, on days when Joyce stopped for drinks and to unwind after work, she was accompanied by Sybil. Apparently, the surveillance conducted by Frank's private investigator on Sybil had uncovered information about Joyce's activities. Joyce seemed surprised when Sybil began hinting about her extramarital affairs with Frank. Although shocked, Joyce appeared somewhat excited and intrigued, perhaps viewing it through the lens of her long-time fascination with romance novels. I now understood that Joyce found Sybil's behavior thrillingly scandalous. Although she herself wouldn't engage in such behavior, nonetheless, she enjoyed hearing about Sybil's escapades and pledged to keep them confidential as part of their girl talk. For approximately two weeks, the two women had been meeting up for drinks. Then one afternoon, two men approached their table and requested to join them. Joyce was on the verge of declining when Sybil promptly made room for them, welcoming their company. According to the private investigator's report, Joyce seemed noticeably upset, while Sybil appeared to be enjoying herself. Shortly after, Joyce departed, but the report continued to detail how Sybil accompanied both men to a room in the motel building next to the bar, where they stayed for about two hours. The next week, Joyce and Sybil found themselves back at the same bar after work. Bill Gerardo and Phil Avery, the same two men from before, arrived a few minutes later. Once again, they approached the women, who once again agreed to their company. According to the report, Joyce and Sybil briefly left the table to visit the restroom. During their absence, Bill Gerardo produced what appeared to be a small vial from his clothing and emptied its contents into Joyce's drink, using his finger to stir. He then exchanged words with Avery, and they shared a high five and smiles as the women returned. Approximately 20 minutes later, Joyce, having completed her drink and reaching for her purse, seemed to exhibit a slight lack of coordination in her movements. Sybil attempted to ensure her well-being, receiving a confused look and response from Joyce. The two men offered assistance in guiding Joyce to a location where she could rest and recuperate before considering driving anywhere, according to the private investigator's report. It was unsurprising that the men conveniently had a motel room available next door. Yeah, I'm aware he drugged her the first time, Gerardo. I mean, I stated it was her succumbing to his blackmail and returning a second time without being drugged that really infuriated me. But what truly angered me was the fact that she didn't trust me enough to confide in me about what was happening and allow me to assist her in getting out of the mess she found herself in with that scumbag. I had to take a sip of my drink to compose myself. I'm her husband for God's sake, she should trust me enough to let me defend her, to take care of her. What kind of man does that make me if I can't protect my own wife? If she doesn't even trust me enough to confide in me there was a moment of silence as we both stared at our drinks on the bar in front of us. So. Are you still working things out despite all of that, Frank? inquired Frank, nursing a neat wild turkey while I was enjoying an arrogant bastard ale. Yeah, I'm still a bit upset with her, I admitted, taking another swig from the unusually large bottle, but I'll move past it soon. I've arranged for her to have a trauma consultation after such cases as soon as everything clears up. The same counseling center also offers couples therapy, so we've been attending sessions for the past 10 weeks. You know, Sybil was deeply involved with those two creeps. Perhaps she offered to apply a prohibited substance to your wife so that she would be more liberated, Frank interjected, trying to be supportive. Yeah, we discussed that months ago. By the way, have you heard from Sybil? I inquired. Nah, Frank replied, taking another sip, it's like she's disappeared off the face of the earth. But once her money dries up, I bet I'll hear from her. Or maybe her lawyer. In the meantime, I've still got those divorce papers. I started with Chantal Hawk. Chantal says I can change the grounds for divorce from adultery to irreconcilable differences or even abandonment if she stays out of touch long enough. Either way, it doesn't bother me, Frank added, clearly still harboring resentment. Frank would never acknowledge, and I wasn't about to be the one to point out, that his level of anger hinted at lingering feelings for his ex despite her infidelity. I'd gained some insight into such matters from our counseling sessions. Well, I remarked with a smile, at least you finalized the separation paperwork so you're legally free to decompress without worrying about adultery charges. Frank returned the grin, raising his glass towards me. Absolutely, he said, taking another sip. Then, he gazed into the distance for a moment. Let me ask you, Frank continued, have you and Joyce resumed, you know, being intimate? I replied with a smile and a simple nod. 
I had no desire to delve into the details of our bed life now that everything was known. It took a couple of months before we eventually resumed our bedtime relationship, and only after she had been in counseling with a psychologist for a while. But, wow, what a transformation. Joyce seemed determined to make amends. She started doing things regularly that she had always refused to do before, and I couldn't even dream of doing that. The sound of movement behind us, accompanied by a clearing of the throat, made us both turn away from the bar at the same time. A lady stood before us in an exceedingly alluring dark green cocktail dress. It accentuated a generous amount of her ample cleavage and showcased a considerable portion of her thigh, thanks to the slit on one side. Both Frank and I were left without words as we beheld this side of, what's that British expression again? Ah yes, intimacy on legs. Well, she remarked, it appears that you two are acquainted. A spark of familiarity ignited within me, then it dawned on me. Ah, Sergeant O'Neill. Well, I'll be damned, impressive. I never imagined a policewoman could look so good off duty. I struggled to control two urges, one, to keep from blurting out what Frank and I had done together, and two, to not stare in open desire at the sight before us. Actually, it's Lieutenant O'Neill now, but that's just my professional title. When I'm out with my husband, I go by Mrs. Gibson, she explained as a muscular, well-dressed man approached. I didn't recognize him, but I noticed Frank suddenly tense up. Hello, Mr. Simmons, the man greeted. I see my wife has introduced herself to you. Then he turned to me and extended his hand. Jeff Gibson, he said simply. As I shook his hand, he had a firm, purposeful grip, but not overly aggressive. Frank cleared his throat and remarked, Doug, this is Deputy Sheriff Gibson the one. I mentioned who investigated the case concerning my soon-to-be ex-wife a few months back. I arched my eyebrows but remained silent. I handled Mr. Franklin's case with his wife for the Woodstock PD around the same time. Lieutenant O'Neill chimed in, or should I say Mrs. Deputy Gibson now? She seemed slightly amused as her eyes shifted between Frank and me. I made a concerted effort to maintain a neutral expression. Doc and I crossed paths at my divorce lawyer's office. Frank interjected after realizing our wives were acquainted and had some history with the men involved in those incidents. We stayed in touch, now we occasionally meet to commiserate, so to speak, except I interjected, trying to steer the conversation away from prolonging. Frank's wife simply vanished. Meanwhile, my wife and I are working to reconcile and move forward. Lieutenant O'Neill gave me a tight smile and remarked, Mr. Franklin, it's good to know you and your wife are making efforts to reconcile. By the way, the investigation into Mr. Gerardo's assault is still ongoing. Pausing, she waited for my reaction. I'd merely grimaced and took a sip of my beer as she continued. He's still undergoing rehabilitation for his leg, but it looks like he'll have a permanent limp. Fortunately, his arm is recovering well, being right-handed comes in handy, she added. I wasn't particularly concerned about Gerardo's recovery, but I nodded anyway. His wife, Amy, divorced him and took their kids along with a substantial portion of his finances. It seems his reproductive capabilities have also been affected. While still functional, his sperm's motility is low, making it difficult for him to conceive should he remarry. There was a hint of satisfaction in her tone. Certainly, Deputy Gibson interjected. And, Frank, if you happen to come across your ex, please inform them that our investigation into Mr. Avery's assault is still active. Even though his injuries aren't as severe as Mr. Gerardo's, the medical bills are significant. This incident occurred right when Wendy, his wife, filed for divorce. Frank sneered, he's getting what he deserves. Deputy Gibson and his wife exchanged knowing looks before wishing us a pleasant evening and leaving through the front door. Frank and I resumed our drinks, the room falling into silence. After a moment, he looked around and murmured, you made sure the bat was disposed of properly, right? Thank you to everyone who engaged with today's stories. If you enjoyed them, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Stay safe.